people have to live in, in unity. We are still in transition. Civil society has been decimated. Of course we rely on media. And I think the government has not done enough. The international community has failed to respond. No place in the world is perfect. Hello viewers, I'm your host Shivangi Mishra with another episode of South Asia Focus. Let's begin the show. Recent diplomatic tensions between India and Canada have raised eyebrows. Centering around allegations regarding the controversial figure, Hardeep Singh Nijjar, declared a terrorist by India. However, what lies beneath these allegations and their potential consequences has become a subject of intense scrutiny. Some political experts suggest that Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, facing declining popularity ahead of elections, may be seeking Khalistani appeasement given their significant influence in Canada. The diplomatic ties between India and Canada appear to be fraying at the edges. All over allegations concerning the extremist Hardeep Singh Nijjar a Canadian Sikh who was shot dead by unknown assailants in June. And days after Trudeau levelled unsubstantiated charges, no evidence supporting his claims has been presented by his team. And now a more pressing question looms. What's the motive behind these allegations? According to several political analysts, it's Prime Minister Trudeau's dwindling popularity ahead of elections that has triggered this move. He is seeking appeasement among the Khalistani community, a significant and influential presence in Canada's political landscape. Many others have expressed shock over Trudeau's stance, saying a strong Indian response was expected in such a scenario. I know it's very unusual for uh, a, a, a head of government to go public with such explosive allegations against the government, and particularly in the case of India. Um, India, so far as I know, has never been accused of any government in the West, particularly a key Western partner like Canada, of being involved in a state-sponsored uh, assassination. So in that sense, to this point, India's reactions are exactly what one would have expected. The tit-for-tat responses, the expulsion of diplomats, the travel advisory warning. And keep in mind as well, the Indian government is very, it likes to be projected as very strong, confident, nationalistic. So there was no way that India was just going to sit on its hands after these explosive allegations um, were, were made. However, the curious thing is that if these allegations carried more weight or Canada was genuinely serious about them, we'd see a ripple effect across all aspects of Indo-Canada relations. Surprisingly, that hasn't occurred. Canada's Deputy Army Chief Major General Peter Scott recently visited New Delhi and emphasized that these diplomatic strains have had no impact on their defense ties. I'm, I'm fully aware of uh, Prime Minister Trudeau's uh, statement, the government's stance and the government's request for India to participate in uh, and cooperate in the investigation. But really that has no impact on us here at the Indo-Pacific uh, Conference. Uh, we're really here to build relationships army to army and we'll let uh, our governments deal with that issue uh, themselves. Canada's inability to produce concrete evidence has put them on back foot with many deeming this move as purely political. Even India's Foreign Minister Subramanian Jai Shankar reiterated during his UNGA address that Delhi remains open to cooperation and investigation if Canada can provide any proof. That evidence has yet to surface. Uh, one, we told the Canadians that uh, this is not the government of India's policy. Two, we told the Canadians saying that, look, if you have something specific, if you have something relevant, you know, let us know. We are open to looking at it. So, but to, you know, to understand the context of it, uh, in a way, you know, because the picture is not complete without the context in a way, you also have to appreciate, Ken, that uh, in the last uh, uh, few years, uh, Canada actually has seen a lot of organized crime, uh, you know, relating to 
you know, the secessionist uh, uh, forces, organized crime, violence, extremism, they're all very, very deeply mixed up. So, in fact, we have been, you know, talking about specifics and information. We have actually been badgering the Canadians. Uh, we have given them a lot of uh, information about uh, organized crime leadership, which operates out of Canada. Uh, uh, there are uh, a large number of extradition requests. Uh, there are terrorist leaders uh, who have been identified. Uh, so uh, do understand that there is an environment out there. So that is important in a way to, uh, to factor in. Meanwhile, the United States has taken a hands-off approach, suggesting that India is more than capable of handling its own diplomatic negotiations without outside intervention. As the dust settles, some argue that Canada now finds itself isolated. It's unable to furnish any substantial evidence, and even its allies are growing reluctant to support its stance. Trudeau appears to have played a high-stake bluff, trapping himself in a web of diplomatic tensions with no clear exit strategy in sight. In a recent development, the International Monetary Fund has announced its inability to reach a staff level agreement with Sri Lanka during its first review under the 2.9 billion US dollars bailout package. The primary concern cited is the potential shortfall in government revenue generation. Despite Sri Lanka's commendable progress in implementing essential reforms and tentative signs of economic stabilization, the IMF cautioned that the path to full economic recovery remains uncertain with subdued growth momentum. Join us as we dive deeper into IMF's assessment and its implications for Sri Lanka's financial stability. In a recent development, the International Monetary Fund has dropped a bombshell following its extensive two-week assessment of Sri Lanka. The IMF disclosed that no staff-level agreement was reached during the first review of Sri Lanka's 2.9 billion US dollars bailout package. The primary culprit behind this impasse? A looming shortfall in government revenue. While the IMF did commend Sri Lanka for its efforts in implementing vital yet challenging reforms, it did not mince words regarding the nation's economic outlook. It issued a stark warning that Sri Lanka's journey to economic recovery remains precarious with growth momentum lagging behind expectations. Despite early indicators of stabilization in the nation's economic metrics, a full-scale rebound appears elusive. Furthermore, the IMF raised a red flag concerning revenue mobilization. Despite showing improvement compared to the previous year, projections indicate a worrisome deficit of nearly 15% by year-end. Sri Lanka has made commendable progress in imp implementing difficult uh, but much needed reforms. Uh, these efforts are bearing fruit as the economy is showing tentative signs of stabilization. Inflation is down from a peak of 70% to today 1.3% uh, uh, um, and gross international reserves uh, increased by $1.5 billion between uh, March and June this year and shortages of essentials have eased. In response to this fiscal setback and to boost governance, the IMF hammered home the urgent need for Sri Lanka to bolster its tax administration, scrap tax exemptions and launch an aggressive crackdown on tax evasion. These measures are seen as important in shoring up revenues and ensuring the sustainability of economic stabilization efforts. Moreover, the release of the second tranche of approximately 330 million US dollars under the lending programs remain contingent on the achievement of a staff level agreement. Unfortunately, there is no fixed timeline for when this accord might be sealed. 
Amid these fiscal hurdles, Sri Lanka has experienced some rays of hope in recent months. Notably, the nation has witnessed a significant drop in inflation, with rates plummeting to as low as 1.3% in September. Additionally, the Sri Lankan currency has staged a remarkable recovery, appreciating by approximately 12%, while foreign exchange reserves have seen a welcome boost. Discussions are ongoing and the authorities are continuing to make progress on their plans for revenue mobilization targets, anti-corruption efforts and other important structural reforms. While Sri Lanka's pursuit of economic stability holds promise, it remains ensnared by fiscal uncertainties. The IMF's decision to halt a staff-level agreement highlights the urgency of maintaining diligence and pursuing robust reforms to safeguard the nation's financial well-being and drive a sustainable recovery. Moving on. In a recent UN Security Council meeting on Afghanistan, the dire situation of Afghan women and girls took center stage. With over 50 edicts curbing women's rights reported since the last council meeting, the focus turned to labeling the Taliban's treatment of Afghan women as gender apartheid. International human rights lawyers demanded swift action, while Security Council signatories strongly condemned the Taliban's systematic discrimination. The UN Higher Commissioner also highlighted these concerns in a damning report emphasizing the ongoing struggle for women's rights in Afghanistan. In a recent gathering of the UN Security Council concerning Afghanistan, the global spotlight honed in on the distressing and dire situation of Afghan women and girls. The discussions revolved around the harsh realities Afghan women face, particularly in the wake of 50 edicts and decrees on their rights reported since the previous council meeting. The stark assessment coincided with the release of a UN report covering the period from March 2022 to August 2023, highlighting a systematic regression of the rule of law and human rights in Afghanistan, particularly with regard to the rights of women and girls. This systematic and planned assault on women's rights is foundational to the Taliban's vision of state and society, and it must be named, defined, and proscribed in our global norms so that we can respond appropriately. Representatives from the various Security Council member states, including the UK, the UAE, Japan, Malta, Gabon, France, Ecuador, and Brazil, joined in at the UN stakeout to emphasize their collective commitment to addressing this grave issue. The international community's growing awareness of their plight underscores the urgent need for action and support to improve the conditions of Afghan women and girls. The Taliban's return to power in August 2021 following a protracted insurgency against the Western-backed government brought about a dire situation. They promptly rolled back hard-won rights and freedoms for women and girls, imposing draconian bans on education and work. Prior to the Council's deliberations, signatories of the Statement of Shared Commitments for the Principles of Women, Peace and Security made their stance resoundingly clear. We condemn in the strongest terms the Taliban's systematic discrimination, segregation and exclusion of women and girls in Afghanistan. The drastic restrictions on the exercise of their human rights and the impact it is having on their lives are unparalleled worldwide and may amount to gender persecution. We call on the international actors to take effective steps to end these abuses. The resilience of Afghan women, their unwavering determination to reclaim their rights and the global solidarity that supports their cause offer a glimmer of hope. As the world watches, the situation in Afghanistan remains a somber reminder of the challenges 
women and girls continue to face casting a long shadow over their prospects for a brighter future. The international community's commitment to addressing this crisis is palpable, yet the road ahead is fraught with uncertainties. It is a stark reminder that the quest for gender equality and human rights must persist even in the face of adversity to ensure a more equitable and just world for all. Time now for Asia This Week, the stories from across the continent. In a historic move, Israel and Germany have signed a joint declaration of intent along with the Aero Treaty, marking a significant day for both nations. The Aero 3 missile system, designed to intercept ballistic missiles beyond Earth's atmosphere, stands as a crucial component of Israel's missile defense arsenal, complementing systems like the Iron Dome for short-range rockets. The US, having given its nod with a hefty 3.5 billion US dollars approval, has greenlit Israel's largest defense deal with Germany, slated for delivery by 2025. Israeli Defense Minister Joav Gallant emphasized its compatibility with NATO systems. Regarding a Supreme Court ruling on legislation that could impact the removal of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, Garland pledged to respect the court's decision. German Defence Minister Boris Pistorius expressed confidence in an equitable resolution, asserting that democracy in Israel would remain unwavering. The Supreme Court has multiple avenues, including upholding the legislation, striking it down or delaying its enforcement until the next parliamentary elections. Iran has accused Israel of orchestrating a thwarted plot to sabotage its defense industry and missile production, as reported by state media. An unnamed Iranian Defense Ministry official claimed that a network of agents had attempted to introduce faulty components into the manufacturing process of advanced missiles. Israel has not yet responded to these allegations. This incident adds to the ongoing tensions between Israel and Iran, with both nations accusing each other of sabotage and assassination plots over the years, making a prolonged shadow conflict. The year 2023 is special for the Japanese watch company Casio. Casio celebrated its 40th anniversary of the G-Shock, which is a significant milestone for this iconic watch brand known for its durability and innovation. G-Shock watches have been a favourite among sportsperson and outdoor enthusiasts for decades. Casio frequently promotes the event across the world in order to establish G-Shock globally. It introduces familiarity as well as its purpose and capacity to fit into modern lifestyles. G-Shock consequently achieved significant advancements. Based on 40 years of function development and marketing efforts, G-Shock will gain more global admirers in the near future. Casio's intellectual property and licensing team successfully registered a three-dimensional trademark for G-Shock watches in Japan. G-Shock is already registered as a general trademark with a shape, logo and name. A three-dimensional trademark guarantees rights only by shape. It is the first case of Japan's three-dimensional trademark. The most famous three-dimensional trademark is the Colonel Sanders statue of Kentucky Fried Chicken KFC. For registration, Casio's IPR team promoted its trademark to the patent office as G-Shock's original design is very familiar to the people. Casio is adamant that a three-dimensional trademark must have an original square-shaped design. This form was created in an effort to protect glass-like parts 
providing those a shock absorbing toughness. Cassio trial lasted for more than three years before it was registered. It is being offered with pride and esteem for G-Shock by Casio. Now we take you to the culturally rich city of Bhumneshwar where the exciting tourism fair took place right in the heart of this magnificent city. The tourism fair was an attempt to uphold the multi-dimensional aspects of incredible India. The fair was held to encourage tourism among the travel community and Odisha's travel enthusiasts. India remains one of the most ethnically diverse countries in the world. Bhubaneswar, also known as the city of temples, is an ancient city in eastern India that is a thriving centre for art and culture in the state of Odisha. Recently, in a bid to boost tourism among the travel fraternity and travel enthusiasts of Odisha, Blue Eye India Private Limited, an established name in the field of tourism promotion in India, hosted a three-day National Tourism Fair 2023 in Bhubaneswar. This three-day travel trade show was organized by the Ministry of Tourism. Exhibitors from Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan, Gujarat and Himachal Pradesh put their stalls at the tourism fair. टूरिस्ट का जो यहाँ फुटफॉल बढ़ा है उसका दो तीन चीज़ें मेन कारण है सर उसका एक तो ये है कि यहाँ पे जो साफ़ सफाई है सर और यहाँ पे जो टूरिज़म के लिए जो स्टेप्स लिए गए हैं बढ़ावा दिया गया है यहाँ पे सारे इंफ्रास्ट्रक्चर्स हैं जो हमारे रोड्स हैं वो काफ़ी अच्छे हैं सर और यहाँ पर टूरिस्ट डेस्टिनेशन भी काफ़ी अच्छी तरह से मैनेज हो रहा है और यहाँ पर जो रहने के भी जो ऑप्शन हैं यहाँ पर बहुत सारे होटल्स नए खुल गए हैं फाइव स्टार ऑप्शन से लेकर बजट कैटेगरी तक जो कि टूरिस्ट लोगों के लिए बहुत ही अच्छा ऑप्शन दे रहा है The government of Odisha has taken various steps from time to time to promote tourism by pronouncing progressive policies on tourism. The demand for tourism has changed as a result of the travel industry's tremendous rise. Over time, there has also been a rise in demand for stays. The tourism sector has grown manifold with the introduction of new and innovative products and experiences. It is recognized as a major instrument of employment creation, livelihood improvement, and inclusive growth. Tourism development for Odisha has a vast scope. There are unlimited opportunities are there. We have 18 wildlife sanctuaries, two national parks. We have a project in Tiger in Similipal. We have a project in Hidar Kani, a project in Crocodile, where there are पूरे दुनिया में ऐसे दो तीन जगह पे हैं एक ऑस्ट्रेलिया में है और एक वितरकनिका में है सो so, हमारे पास अट्रैक्शंस की कमी नहीं है दिस थ्री डे एग्जीबिशन आल्सो शोकेस्ड न्यू बिजनेस ओरिजिन फॉर फर्दर इंप्रूवमेंट ऑफ ट्रैवल ट्रेड एक्टिविटीज इन द कंट्री the tourism fair is not just to attract trade buyers and sellers from various sectors but also to bring a large number of travelers seeking the best packages for hotels and tours indeed the tourism fair in odisha's tourism industry brought together the local travel industry travel enthusiasts and other associated businesses under one roof So if you are an intrepid explorer, a nature lover or simply looking to relax on beautiful beaches, Odisha has something special in store for you. And with that, we come to the end of this week's episode. See you next week. Goodbye and take care. People have to live in, in unity. We are still in transition. Civil society has been decimated. Of course we rely on media. And I think the government has not done enough. The international community has failed to respond. No place in the world is perfect.